Hello, welcome back to Clickbait, and as you may have guessed from what's behind me, I've always kind of liked collecting cameras of different eras and generations and styles and film formats just to sort of experiment with them and just to sort of see what they're like really. They're all very different and unique in their own special ways. And this is something I bought many, many years ago. There used to be a really good marketing Maidstone of all kinds of bits and pieces and things. And this little Zeiss Icon Netar 515, I think cost me under five pounds, but 1992 probably. Um, so it's been around for a while and it's been on the shelf a long time. I think in that time I've maybe only put one or two films through it. Back in 1936, 37 when this thing was, was new, this would have been you know, cutting edge, simple, easy to use, the iPhone in your pocket of the day basically because it was a small camera that folded up, bellows disappear into the body and it's no bigger than well half a paperback book. It'll fit into a coat pocket or a, or a handbag and then fold out into a usable camera and everything is adjustable and settable. So focus, aperture, shutter speed, it's all there. It's even got a self timer. So your 1930s selfies are a thing. It is though very, very basic. It is utterly manual, of course. So working from the front, we've got a focus ring, which is literally the front element unscrewing away from the end of the camera. And to stop you going too far past infinity and close focus point, there is a screw and a stop, so you can't focus past that point. This is an f7.5 centimeter or 75 millimeter, although that's not 75 millimeter in 35 millimeter terms because this is a 120 film format camera. So that's about a 40 millimeter or so in, uh, in 35 millimeter terms. For such a small bit of glass, it's quite fast. It's an f4.5, so we can use it in fairly lowish light situations because film sensitivity wasn't that great back in the 30s, so it needed to be a relatively fast bit of glass. Now on this enameled black ring around the focus element, we've got uh, the camera name, the z Icon. We've got a little logo of, uh, I believe that says K-L-I-O, Clio, and a little almost like a twisted Mercedes-Benz or Isle of Man symbol on the right hand side. So I'm sure that means something, but I couldn't find any reference to it. But the important thing that matters on this front ring is the shutter speed. This dial here, well, the outer ring of the dial moves independently of this black enamel circle. This is the shutter speed running down from T, as in click once to open, click twice to close, B for bulb, so click and hold to open, down to a second, half a second, moving up without any stops all the way to 175th of a second. So that's not that fast, but I guess, and again, for the day, it was good. Now this is where things become interesting. This is the shutter cock. So you don't wind on to cock and prepare the film as one action. You have to independently crank the handle to wind the film on, push this around to prepare the shutter, and then you can push it to release it. Incidentally, it's the shutter is on the left-hand side, which is slightly unusual. And it actually works by a purely mechanical, very mechanical method of this. So this chrome button goes straight into a metal bar, which runs the width of the camera behind the bellows. And you can see at this end, it connects to a little metal bar, which pivots. And as it pushes that way with the shutter button at this end, the other end is pushed that way. And that physically pushes the release for the shutter and the shutter is clockwork you are literally winding the clockwork to set it and of course your self timer is also clockwork although it's a little bit slow these days and the other important setting we've got is our aperture which is a slider on the top of the lens barrel going from f4.5 in fact it does wind slightly further than f4.5 almost to f4 all the way down to f32. And it's nicely made, it's all metal construction with uh, a leatherette coating on it. It cantilevers smoothly back into there and opens neatly as well, pops out. The bellows have got no air or light leaks, which is a good thing. And on top, you've just got two buttons the uh, shutter button and the bellows release. Underneath, you've got a screw thread for a tripod and your wind on lever. And on the back, apart from our name and model number, Netar 515 and Zeiss Icon or Zeiss Icon, and there are two little red windows so you can see 
with these portholes open if you've got your film loaded and it's safe to open, which is done by just pulling this little lever here and the entire back of the camera swings open, revealing the back of the bellows, the back of the lens and where you're going to put the film. Now it all appears to work, function properly as far as I can tell from just sitting here twiddling with the buttons, but it'll be fun to put a couple of rolls of film through it and see what the lens looks like, see how good the resolving power of this old bit of glass is. Bear in mind, this camera is late 30s, so it's, it's 90 years old. This is almost a century old camera. So what's it going to be like popping out the rangefinder, taking a few pictures in the modern world? Let's find out. It takes ordinary 120 size roll film. There's an old roll, for example, in this has been previously shot. So we've got a roll of HP5 to play with, so let's kind of see what we can do in town. There's a 1930s building over there, and maybe I'll get 16 of these shots off before it rains. <clears throat> so I will need the old spindle off the old film to roll the new film into. This is the wind on here to, to wind it on. Here in the back, got a little advert for Zeiss Icon Film. Use their own brand film and says to use it, uh, six by nine centimetre, or two and a quarter by three and a quarter inches. Now the back window, you can see the numbers on the paper back of the film. Well, it's a 1930s camera, so let's take it to a 1930s building and start with something easy, a building that's not moving anywhere. Street photography is all about movement. Let's get the hang of the camera first. It's a rangefinder, so you're going to flip a little rangefinder thing. And looking through, it's so misty, it's like you're looking back at a 90-year-old bit of film anyway, without even taking the photo first. Obviously, there's no light meter, so I'm using an app for this one, and I've told it it's ISO 400 film. I'm going to set F14 on the camera, because we can do that quite happily. And that tells me I want about 1 or 1 50th of a second, which I can set on the front of the camera here. Let's line this up and see how we go. Right, let's to get to prime it first. There's no actual stops on the aperture or the shutter, so if you want to be kind of in between places, you can be. Let's try that one more time. And this is the old Roots building. It was built in 1936 for the Roots car group. It was their headquarters outside of London and one of their factories as well. It's their flagship showroom, so it's a beautiful bit of Art Deco. Now, let's look at another shot with the Zeiss, which now reckons we're looking at a 200 one, well, 160th of a second, uh, looking up at the sky. Interesting, our fastest shutter speed is 175th of a second, which is not a common shutter speed, I have to say. Let's get this tower in shot. The left-hand shutter button is quite unusual. That's your button to open the front, and that's your shutter button. And the uh, old wind-on. One handy thing with this, despite being medium format, it fits in your back pocket quite happily. I'll be honest, I've got no idea if this camera even works or not. Obviously I can see mechanically it works, but the lens could be mouldy and fusty, the shutter speeds could be all off, and I don't know if the... Uh, well, everything's working really. It's so simple though, it should be. It's like an Austin 7, but in camera form. Same era, really. So it'll be interesting to see if it does actually work. I bought it probably in about 1990 or so for, I think, three or four pounds on a market stall. I was quite excited when I started Googling what these things were. I saw about 800 pounds and then realized it was a completely different model. These are worth about 20 quid still. So it's not exactly not the greatest photographic investment I've ever made. Let's get this framed wire. I keep forgetting to focus it as well. I'm not seeing stuff through the rangefinder, so uh, I think I may have wasted a couple of shots on those, those last ones too. Hopefully that hairdresser one looks good, because that looked pretty cool. I was going to say this isn't the best street photography camera because everything is so slow to set up. You can't react to things happening beyond just pointing it a little bit differently. But perhaps I've been using it the wrong way. Really, this is a perfect street photography camera because it forces you to find a spot, look for the background and wait for the person to walk through and become the shot as you're pre-framed. So let's give that a go. Gosh, maximum shutter speed now.
Well, that was kind of unexpected. I seem to have got nine shots out of that instead of the uh, advertised 17. So uh, we'll go and look at that and the developing tank. So that first effort wasn't a massive success. I've learned a lot of lessons about using this camera again for the first time in 20, 30 years. First of all, you mustn't forget to focus. Focusing is important. Secondly, mustn't forget to wind on between shots because winding on between shots is also important, it turns out. And the other thing, which is very important, is the uh, numbers on the back of the film do not in any way correlate with the frame positions of this thing. So winding on from one to two means you miss half the shots. So basically I only got six shots. I shot more than six because I double exposed quite a few. So this was a learning curve. What I've also found is this is disappointingly muzzy. I thought this lens looked quite crisp looking at it on the shelf, but uh, this is actually a little bit of a fuzz fest. So uh, the street photography, this one would have been quite a cool shot with the two guys sort of looking back over their shoulder at the girl walking up behind them. Could have been quite an amusing picture in terms of street photography, but uh, it's just all grain. There's just no resolution there. Maybe the exposure's off combined with the focus being off combined with an old lens, but I don't know, that doesn't really work. That could have been a great picture, but that's kind of just unfortunately not worked, worked out very well. So what else have we got that worked out? This shot of the Roots garage was probably, would have been the best shot on the roll in terms of crispness, resolution, being in focus and correctly exposed. Unfortunately, it looks like I started taking pictures too quickly before I'd um, wound it all the way into the, the take up roll. And so I've inadvertently cut through that first frame. So the one good frame on the picture is lost. What is apparent though from that, you can see that it's in focus in the dead center of the shot, but to the far right and the far left of the frame, it's starting to drift off focus a little tiny bit. So that's not necessarily great, but it is a 90 year old budget camera. So the technology was not as good then for budget devices as it is now, not by a long way. Okay, these two could have been good, but it looks like they were both a bit underexposed. The phone app isn't necessarily the best. This is the tower on top of the Roots building and the, a repeat of the side shot of the building, uh, which I've managed to double expose into something a little bit weird. So two shots lost because I forgot to wind on because there's no lockout on this thing. So if you don't wind on, you just keep on taking as many pictures as you want. It'll keep on going forever. Again, it just feels very, I don't know, very soft, very lacking resolution. This is the old building down uh, the back street in town. You can kind of make out what I was going for here, but it's just so gray. It just doesn't really work too well but it's just kind of so grey and soft. It feels like a picture from, well, a picture from 100 years ago, really. This is an another attempt at street photography. But again, the focus is just so far off. So trying to get more street photography, the problem we have here is the highest shutter speed is 175th of a second, which means capturing motion isn't really working very well. Unless you pan with something, you're not gonna get it at all. And this is just a guy walking at regular walking speed past the camera and he's completely blurred out, so that's a bit of a shame. So what are the lessons we've learned with this first roll of test film? Well, first of all, don't forget the basics of using a camera. Nothing is done for you. Secondly, I don't know, just take more time. Forget using it as a street photography camera because it's not really gonna work out as that. It's time to get another roll of film and try again. So after last week's less than stellar attempt to take some photos with the Zeiss Icon, lessons were learned. First of all, I've now counted how many turns of this winder it takes to wind onto the next frame, not rely on the numbers on the back, because we know that doesn't work. Secondly, I've given the lenses front and back a really good clean because there's a lot of misting going on there that didn't look too clever. And also, based on the fact that the last lot of pictures were, well, I say a waste of filming exactly, but certainly didn't get the best out of a brand new roll of, of Ilford, I've gone back and found in the back of the shelf, this has been an ornament on my cupboard for, well, a long time. Bear in mind, the date on it says September 1991. There's a chance this roll of Pan F is past its best, but in this particular camera, that's probably not a major issue. So we can load up with this Pan F, and it's a nice bright day today, and this is only ISO 50. So I've come down to the riverside with a brand new bridge been built, so that looks quite exciting, I think. Uh, it's got strong geometric graphic stuff, because that's kind of what seems to work best with this lens's resolving power. Wow. It always feels like a shame to open this. It feels like something that should be in a museum. Wow, Alpha Pan F from 1991. This is probably 
stolen from a photographic studio, or given to me at a photographic studio I should say, when I was doing work experience back in about 1991 because I did go and do a few of those back then. Gosh, let's hope this is still actually going to work after all these years. So a significantly shinier bit of glass on the back of there. I'm wondering if just a level of dust and grime on the back of that is partly why I was getting such muzzy old photos with that previous attempt. If you've not loaded a roll of medium format in a while, you forget just how hassle-filled it actually is. There we go, we're on. That feels like it's moving. So I'm going to set the camera to f8 on the lens. That should give us a decent amount of depth of field on here. And I'll set the iPhone light meter app to ISO 50 and to f8 on there as well. And that's now telling me a hundredth of a second, if you can see that at all. That's probably just changed completely. It said a hundred when I held it up there though. So let's go for a hundredth on the camera, which we then set on the lens. Wind it around to one hundredth of a second. There we go. So cock the shutter. Let's not forget to wind on between each shot this time. Okay, that feels more positive. I don't know, maybe it's me feeling positive. So it's a double wind to get to the second place. So that's one, two. That should be one frame. I'll give it a tiny bit more just to make sure. Let's try that one more time. I'm going to try that at F11 as well. A little bit dark perhaps. Cock the shutter. Yeah, with the shutter cocker. There we go. If I step back and frame that with the fence, wait for the bike to be in the right place. That's good. That's quite cool looking the other way. It's like a silhouette against the uh, the river. So don't forget to wind on every time. Don't forget to wind on because that's what I was doing wrong last time. I was either winding it too far or not at all. This time I've learned my lesson. I get 12 whole frames out of this. Now this scene behind me is an amazing kind of silhouette of the fence with the water sheening with the sunlight on it. Now I'm going to try doing two things. Um, first of all, I know it's 100th at F8 going that way. Going this way, it reckons it's a thousandth for a correct exposure. So I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to shoot it at a hundredth so that I can get the silhouette. I'm going to try bumping the shutter speed as far as it will go just to, just to see. So we are still on F8, one hundredth. This isn't exactly quick and easy to use. Cock the shutter. Make sure this is a portrait with the shutter on the left hand side. Now the fastest I can go to on this shutter speed dial is 175th of a second, which means I've got to take the exposure down as far as I can as well, which is to F32. That would potentially give me, let's wind this on before I forget, one, two, a correctly-ish exposed, well I think I'm for a few stops away there. Let's give that a quick go. Left hand shutter feels weird. I love taking pictures of bridges. They're so, I don't know, the structure of them is amazing. Not just the, the thought of joining two places together. They're just amazing graphic shapes. It's just so strong against normally a natural or even an artificial skyline. They're amazing things to take pictures of. Okay, let's wind this thing on again. One, two, I think this is back up to a hundredth. I will be honest, I'll be amazed if any of these pictures are in any way usable, but it's nice to try, isn't it? I still forget to cock the shutter nearly every time. But that stark geometry, the bright contrast between the white concrete and the shadows is just amazing against the sky as well. I love that kind of picture. If these actually come out, these would be pretty cool pictures. Fortunately, the light isn't really changing too much. I can stick with my one shutter speed and uh, aperture combination. Well, that's it, that's my lot. That did not last long at all. It's amazing how quickly 12 shots will go. Especially if you're having fun and you're used to digital, we can just keep on plugging away as long as you want. Uh, right, so I'm gonna get this developed and see how it comes out. I'm kind of hoping it does work out because this camera is so small, it's a little bit discreet and a bit different and so silent as well. In some ways, it could be a perfect uh, street photography camera because you can use it in anywhere just silently. Right, I'm gonna take a few pictures with the digital because the light here is too good to ignore. Well. I have to admit that role of Pan F didn't pan out quite as well 
as perhaps it couldn't have done. It was definitely past its sell-by date, and uh, when I took it out of the developing tank, well, when I put it into the developing tank, it felt very strange. If you've never rolled or unrolled a roll of 120 film before, it's got the film layer, this bit of plastic here, and the paper layer on the back, and you have to separate them as you put it in the tank. And I couldn't find the second layer when I was loading it, and when I brought it out of the tank, it turned out that the two layers over the last 29 years had welded themselves. In fact, more than 29 years, that was the best buy date, it was 1991. So it was pre made at some point in the mid 80s, so it's over 30 years old. The two layers had become permanently welded and it wasn't in any way usable. So I had to knit back with a roll of, I think it's called Porter 400. It's 400 ASA, I think it's French, but I've never used it before. But it was really nice film actually. So fortunately, the sunlight was just about the same. And I got down to take a few more pictures, and here it is. Very nice fine grain, fine contrast, and it turns out that my guessing about rolling the uh, the crank two twists around was about right actually, because here are the gaps between the frames. It's quite a nice roll of negatives. If we look at what we've got here, so yeah, if we now look at what we've got here on the screen, these are the the raw negatives, if you like, and the uh, contrast and the tonal range is, is pretty good. I don't know if it helps that I uh, clean the glass, that might have been a big difference to get all the dust and grease off there. Also probably helps that I was taking a bit longer to focus more carefully because that is one thing you really do forget. You get so used with new cameras to just point the thing up there, it snaps into focus before you've even thought about it. And because this is a rangefinder and so that's kind of always in focus, you kind of don't naturally remember to go and do the focusing stage of the actual taking a photo because you're not seeing it out of focus if you're out of practice with the rangefinders. So yeah, this is the end of the uh, the walk around. There's some scaffolding. That one's not quite sharp. I was taking a guess. I had it set to F22 the entire way through because 400 ISA. Um, I found one big problem in that 400 ISO and it's quite bright. The fastest shutter speed I've got on here is 175th of a second. And that really limited me to just top two or darkest two uh, apertures of f22 and f32 and lenses are never quite their sharpest at their ultimate heavy end so i moved it back a stop to f22 and that put me around a hundredth of a second for pretty much everything to be honest so more or less stayed at 100 hundredth of a second f22 for all of these photos and then it's got what looks like a hyperfocal distance focusing point at it's only feet because it's old 30 feet and that's just before infinity. So a lot of the stuff was taken at 30 feet into the distance, but the closer things were guessed at. I'm not really a foot person, I'm more metric, so it's an added extra element of guesswork throwing in the imperial measurements. So yeah, we have got some scaffolding, and this is a good test of the, uh, of the resolving power of the lens just there. Uh, looking down the, uh, the footpath, things were a bit more hit and miss um, you can sort of see though how good we'll, we'll talk more about each we'll talk more about each picture individually in a second to sort of assess how the camera did and how I did as well uh, but you can sort of see from these how they're fairly consistent uh, the exposure really is the big difference here uh, that mark there on the lens on the film is a crinkle from processing and then we get up to the bridge where it's deep shadow, bright light. This contrast is really lovely. That shows the resolving power of a lens that's pushing a century old can still be pretty good. Now this roll was pretty much a success. All 12 or so pictures I took seem to have come out within 90% sort of, of being an okay picture, give or take. Um, I have very briefly gone through and I've just rotated them, inverted them from negative to positive, and I've done a little bit of levels and contrast just to kind of bring out half a decent picture in there. And this is the first one I took on the on the Portra 400. This is trying to get the light on the on the water and the silhouette, but guessing that with the uh, exposure meter from a phone was something of a challenge, and we've gone a bit overexposed on this one. We might be able to bring it back a little bit more, but this has really pushed the boundaries of what we can do here. So yeah, that was a challenging picture for this old thing. But it's not done too bad of a job. I mean, you can sort of see what we were shooting for there. Then next up, we've got a shot of the bridge in the distance. Now, what you can see I've done here is I've focused too close, hoping to get the hyperfocal distance and get the entire thing in shot in focus. But it's got the fence actually very sharp indeed. Uh, but the bridge is not quite 
as sharp as it could be. We can claim that was intended. But the, the contrast, again, is impressive. I, after that first roll of film, I had pretty much written this camera off as, as dead. Maybe it's an old roll of film, maybe it was just the dirt on the lens was just too much, I don't know. And moving down the, the water side, here we've got another similar shot. This one, this is, uh, yeah, I quite like this. There's a lot of contrast in it, a lot of different angles going on. I do like the uh, disappearing into the distance of the, uh, the shadows and the fence. And the thing I notice about this though, is that even though this is clearly a modern subject, this architecture of the bridge, the metalwork of the fence, is clearly very, very modern indeed. But there's something about the way the lens has resolved the image that makes it look like it was taken sort of early part of the mid-century, the 1930s or 40s. And it's funny how the camera has changed the subject into something that looks from that period, even though it's very clearly not. What I am noticing here though, is that it's a slight softening on the right hand side of the image, although the writing is also a little bit soft as well, so I think that's where I've uh, well, I haven't got a medium format scanner here, so I've just used my uh, Nikon Z6 photographing on the light box. But that's a real guide to look through what you're focusing on. You're very much guessing on the distance, and that's not quite sharp. I thought at f22, most of it would be pretty much in focus, but it's not as uh, deep a depth of field as I was anticipating. Now, this is the one I was looking forward to. This is probably the best shot on the roll. Now, there is something kind of timeless about a picture of a bridge like this. It could have been taken somewhere in Europe in 1940 or so, it's got a real, I don't know, the, the picture is sharp, the negative is sharp, and the scan's not bad either. But it's something to do with the grain and the way that the lens has resolved it. It just looks like a picture taken 60 years ago. But I, I actually really like this picture. I'm gonna say this is the, the best picture on the roll. The lovely crisp line from the deep shadow under the bridge into this harsh bright sunlight on the side of the concrete and then we've got this other band of mid-tone followed by just a level of detail up here it's very cool i like it a lot now we get a little bit of an attempt at street photography because there were a few people out and this one we've actually got caught the runner with his shadow unfortunately because this is maximum 175th of a second Freezing movement is not that easy, so we do what we can. But that's quite a nice image. Again, it looks like it was taken during that Second World War or something. The mechanical shutter's got a bit of a delay because there's such a long route from there to there to there to there before it actually clicks. So didn't quite catch the bike where we wanted him. And also his shadow's not come out as well as I had hoped either, so that one's a bit of a fail. A low shot looking up at the people in the distance and they've not really resolved very well. It's a bit heavy pixels. Let's move on from that one. That was a good attempt, but this one I do quite like. This is quite fun because we've got the two women walking side by side there and two more people walking down in the distance there. You would think though F22, it would be sharp, but again, the depth of field just isn't quite there. Very strange. Now we've got our scaffolding pictures, which do actually show this one in particular that if you get everything right, a bit like the bridge, it can be sharp, but it takes a lot more thought and a lot more effort than a modern camera does. So there you have it, a 90 year old camera. You can get some good pictures. And I think the thing to take away with this is that maybe doing street photography might be possible, but everything needs to be set up and waiting because you have to remember to wind on, you have to remember to cock the shutter, you have to remember to be ready for everything. So you just have the camera set up so a subject can walk into the position and bang. It's not like using modern mirrorless where you can be ready to move and snatch a shot at a moment's notice. You have to be ready and waiting to pounce. But maybe look at more period subjects, oh, period architecture, cars, people in costume of the day, because it will create the image of being 50, 60, 70 years ago. Well, after initially writing this camera off, I'm thinking maybe it has got a future. It's got a few more rolls of uh, medium format, 120 film. Let's see what else we can do with it. Another winter project. Yet another winter project. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please hit like and subscribe as always with YouTube. And I'll see you again next time with a probably more modern camera.